Good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to the Ramanujan special seminar of the special functions and number theory seminar here. Uh, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce today's speaker for the Ramanujan special. It's Professor Sean Cooper from Massey University in Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, Professor Cooper got his PhD from University of Wisconsin under the supervision of Professor Richard Askey. And uh, I got introduced to his work back in 2000 seven as a first year PhD student when uh, he wrote some beautiful papers on cubic elliptic functions, cubic theta functions uh, that I had really very enjoyable time reading. And since then we have been in touch on and off through email, um, sometimes uh, in person at conferences. So he has also written two very nice books, the recent one being Ramanujan's Theta Functions. Uh, by Springer, and uh, the one before that was uh, based on the book by Venkatachali Engar on um, alternative theories of elliptic functions. So it's honor to introduce him today. Uh, he'll be talking today on apere like sequences defined by four term recurrence relations, theorems, and conjectures. Over to you, Professor. Um, thanks very much for the nice introduction, Atul. It's my um, it's my my pleasure to um, give this lecture, and um, th th thank you to the organisers for inviting me. So I'm going to talk about Arpery like sequences. Uh, you can read the rest of the title. So let's start with what are Arpery numbers. So we'll go back to uh, uh, 400 years ago and some old question which i'm sure everybody knows the answer so this is the sum of the reciprocals of the square numbers so apparently euler answered that it's pi squared over six and nowadays undergraduate students see this in fourier series and you probably know the corresponding result for fourth powers pi to the four over 90 sixth powers and there's a general result for even powers um, in contrast for the sum of the reciprocal of the cubes well if you do the obvious thing and interpolate with a pi cubed you don't seem to get a nice denominator and if you look at the number itself look almost nothing is known about that number and so it came as um, quite a surprise in the 1970s um at, at, a, at a conference when it, the um abstracts uh, announced that roger apri was going to prove that that number was irrational and there had been some rumors about that and basically nobody seemed to believe it and when Apri gave the lecture um, the, the the disbelief just just increased um, because of some of the incredible um, results that Apri conjectured anyway here's the theorem the theorem it turned out to be true it, uh, the proof turned out to be correct I mean and now Apri is famous for having done that and um, one of the tools he used in the proof is this three term recurrence relation so if you forget about these just ignore these cubic polynomials in front it says the n plus first term equals the nth term minus the n minus first term it's like the fibonacci numbers except the coefficients are polynomials of degree three in the index n. Uh, notice you only need a single initial condition to start the sequence. If you put n equals zero in this recurrence, then you'll be calculating a1 in terms of a naught. And because of the n cubed, when n is zero, it doesn't matter what a negative one is. So the single initial condition is enough to get things started. So let's calculate a few. So to get a n plus one, you'll need to divide by the cube of n plus one. So a one is five, that's easy. A two, you'll need to divide by two cubed, 
And that turns out to be, when you do it all, 73. When you calculate a three, you'll need to divide by three cubed. So chances are you probably get some kind of rational number, but it turns out to be an integer. And same for a four, you've got to divide by four cubed. So the expectation from the recurrence is you expect these to be rational numbers with huge, huge denominators growing like the cube of n factorial. But Arpari claimed these were integers, hence the, uh, this unlikely assertion. So here's a second unlikely assertion. Um, if we consider this um, term bn defined by this binomial sum, then the bn's satisfy. So this is the same recurrence relation as the Arpari numbers. And look, it's an interesting exercise to try and do this. If you just take bn, substitute n plus one, substitute n minus one, and try you know, combining the two terms on the right-hand side, it's uh, unless you do some very clever tricks, which nowadays is called creative telescoping, this, it's very hard to show that this um, sum satisfies this three-term recurrence relation. And um, yes, apparently at, at the time of the conference, some very good mathematicians couldn't do that. And of course, Arpari rather enjoyed that. So today there's an algorithm for doing that, which you can do on a computer by typing two lines of text. So here's a, um, a table of the first few Arpari numbers. So we calculated the first few by hand. And so one question you may wonder is, are there any divisibility or number theoretic properties of this sequence? So there, there, are, there are a few, and here is one due to Gessel. So what you do is let n be any positive integer and choose any prime p greater than three. So I'll take the smallest option, five. And write the n in base p. So if you write 54 in base 5, well, here it is. I, I don't know. I haven't done this sort of thing since primary school. But 54 is 2 times 5 squared plus 0 times 5 plus 4 times 5 to the 0. So in base 5, we would write 2, 0, 4, corresponding to the base 5 digits. Then Gessel proved that a n and a of these digits of the base five or base p expansion multiplied together, leave the same remainder on division by p. So in this example, a54 and a2 times a0 times a4, they'll be congruent to each other mod five, so um, three in this case. This is called a Lucas property after Lucas, who proved that the binomial coefficients have a similar property. Um, okay, so that's property number three. Property number four. If we define these two infinite products, y and w. So what the key to see, what there's to see here is this product of one minus q to the j, 1 minus q to the 2j, 1 minus q to the 3j, and 1 minus q to the 6j, all taken to different powers. And there's a similar product down here using the same terms to different powers. And the w has a q multiplying it. So there's the first few terms. Then formally, at least, it's possible to expand the power series y as a sum of powers of W. So here we go, we're going to ex expand Y in powers of W. And if we calculate the coefficients, then the coefficient CN turns out to be the nth Arpari number. So um, this is an incredible result. It has to do, it comes from the theory of modular forms, which is a um, you know, major enterprise 
in, in mathematics. And these modular forms have what we call level six, which you can kind of see from the one, two, three, and six um, in there. Another question you might ask is how big are these numbers? And um, here's an asymptotic formula. They grow roughly like one plus root two to the four n. There's a constant k, which um, has this value. So um, yeah, in, in view of these um, you know, interesting properties, uh, one, one question is, are there other sequences with similar properties? So um, to, to, to do that, I'm going to, um, well, here's the upper numbers. I just put them again. And if these coefficients are polynomials of degree three. Now, Zagier investigated a similar type of three-term recurrence relation for which the coefficients are polynomials of degree two. And I've just noted here, if, if C is zero, which makes it a two-term recurrence relation, then you, you'll know you can factor the second quadratic here, that the generating function is a 2F1 hypergeometric function. So the generating function for this Tn, in some sense, is a generalization of the 2F1 hypergeometric function, whereas the hypergeometric function has three um, singular points, the generating function here has four. Uh, and I just pointed out for this um, cubic case, if you drop the last term and factor these other cubics, then the generating function is a 3F2 um, hypergeometric function. So uh, that's what these things are generalizations of. Anyway, back to Zagier. Zagier did a computer search over the parameter space A, B, and C to find sequences that are integer valued and non-trivial. So non-trivial means if you get two consecutive terms which are zero, then all future terms will be zero. So we're not interested in that. We call that terminating. And there are a few other sort of trivial or simple cases. So we, we want to dis, discard those ones. So Zagia found six. And a remarkable property of those six is each of them is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the cubic um, recurrence relation. So that's an incredible result. So that makes 12 such sequences. And here's a table so we can see what they all look like. So I'll just draw your attention to the second column. Here's the parameters A, B, and C. So there's these six, you know, unusual sort of values. And if you put them in this quadratic three-term recurrence relation, that's what Zagier found. And so, for example, the 728 case, um, the three-term recurrence relation denoted by Tn here, has a, it's the sum of the cubes of the binomial coefficients satisfies that recurrence relation. The Arpuri numbers with the cubic coefficients, so the Arpuri numbers, here they are here, they correspond to this minus 17 minus 6 minus 72 case, and they have the A, B, and C um, uh, in, in, this, in this column here. I just put tick marks next to all the other ones. I didn't want to overload this table with form that there, there are sums of binomial coefficients for all 12, um, for all 12 entries. I just wanted to highlight just the Arpuri numbers, the sum of the binomial, some of the cubes of the binomials, and this other one, which sort of looks like Arpuri numbers, except it's got one fewer factor. So there's 12 such sequences in this framework. It's not known if there are any more. Um, I'll just like to draw your attention to this other one with this minus one to the n. 
Um, if you drop that minus one to the end, the, these numbers are were actually known a long time ago. They're called dome numbers. They have a similar parameterization to the upper numbers, and they have some combinatorial interpretation, and they were found by a physicist. Uh, dome more than what 60 years ago. So that gives 12 such sequences. Um, look, a few years after that, I was motivated to do a similar search like Zagia did. So my idea was to insert the D here. The Apri numbers and the dome numbers have D equals zero. I had a reason for including the D um, because I the, the sum of the fourth powers of the binomial coefficients satisfy such a recurrence relation. Anyway, um, my computer search yielded three such sequences. The middle one here was already known. That's the sum of the fourth powers of the binomial coefficients. So I found these other two. And there are binomial sums now for all three of those. And the modular parameterizations involve levels 7, 10, and 18, respectively. So that brings the number of such sequences to 15 sequences. So six due to Zagia, six cubic ones like the Apri numbers, and then these three other ones makes 15. Um, yeah, so what properties do they have? So they're all 15 are known to satisfy Lucas congruences. And so you can see work by Malik and Straub or recent work by Gorodetsky for more information about these 15 sequences. So I wonder if there are others and how they might be found. So to talk about where you might look for other types of sequences, I'd like to go back to a prototype of Ramanujan. So this is um, the first page of one of Ramanujan's most famous published papers. So this is the one where Ramanujan's famous series for one over pi appear in. This is the first page. So I'm going to skip forward a few pages. And I just want to draw your attention to this equation 25. So Ramanujan just starts with that. He says, it is known that when k is less than 1 over root 2, this formula. And OK, so I want us to look at that. Here's what Ramanujan, Ramanujan had. And so this you can write in terms of you know, there's three factors in the, because of the cube, there's um, three shifted factorials, and this is basically a factorial in the denominator three times. So it's a 3F2 hypergeometric function. The capital K is something called the complete elliptic integral of the first kind, and this is a lowercase k, and the k prime is what's called the complementary modulus. So what's going on is this complete elliptic integral, it's well known, that's a 2f1 hypergeometric function. Ramanujan is considering its square. And so the square of this particular 2f1 hypergeometric function is known to be a 3f2 hypergeometric function. And that's an instance of what's called Clausen's identity. So that's the simplest interpretation of where Ramanujan is starting off there. Now, Ramanujan had much more than that in mind. And so I just want to talk briefly about what Ramanujan was doing with this. So I'm going to re rename the left-hand side. I'm going to just call that capital Z. Now, it's got a modular parameterization, and it's simply the generating function 
for the sum of four squares. So I'm just going to quote that as a result. And this 2k k dash squared, most of that business, I'm going to call that capital X. And it turns out that's got a quite a stunning um, parameterization um, in terms of these modular forms. And so what Ramanujan is saying is that when you expand this Z as a power series and powers of X, it's got this nice, simple parameterization where the coefficients are cubes of binomial coefficients. So of course, there's a theorem behind this. So I want to just briefly talk about how and why and what other examples. So just by the way, so again, I'm, I'm leaving behind the complete elliptic integral and all that notation. And instead, I'm going to work with these Q series and Q products. I'm going to work with those instead. So what is going on here? So I'm going to take a slightly different starting point. I'm going to start with W as being the quotient of two Dedekind eta functions. So over here on the right is Dedekind eta function, which I'll denote by eta one. And you'll see here I've got an eta four. So eta four means just replace Q with Q to the four in Dedekind's eta function. That's eta four. So we start with this quotient of Dedekind eta functions, call that W, and then define X to be this rational function of W, and then Z. I mean, this is a lot to unload on you, but what you, this is the first of many examples, and all the other, this is the prototype, and all the other examples will turn out to have the same structure. So Z is um, some eta quotients, eta, eta products again, divided by some power of X. The power of X is chosen to make everything balance in a certain way. Then the result is, there's a simple differentiation formula for the X. So the differentiation formula for the X involves the X itself times the Z times this algebraic function, which I'm calling B, which is square root of 1 minus 64x. That's the first result. And then the main result is that this, um, this weight 2 modular form Z satisfies a second order nonlinear differential equation with respect to x, where D is this differential operator, B, X, D, D, X. So B is just this square root 1 minus 64 X, and H is 8 X. So that's the result. And I, I'm, I'm not going to torture you with the proof, but I, I would just like to point out the ingredients. So all you need to know are what I call the fundamental theta function identity. So you need to know the Lambert series for the sum of four squares, the analogous result for sum of eight squares, something called Ramanujan's differential equations for Eisenstein series. That's basically all you need to know. And then the rest is just a calculation. So um, that's what's behind Ramanujan's result. Now, in the same paper, Ramanujan says here, there are corresponding theories in which Q is replaced by, so here we see these capital Ks again, and these are no longer um, the elliptic integrals, they're not, no longer 2F1 of 1 half, 1 half, 1, they're 2F1s with slightly different parameters, and there's three such theories. So I'd like to say something just a little bit about this, about this middle theory here, how that fits into the situation. So this middle theory, here's the situation. So similar to what we just had, you start with W as a quotient of two dedicant eta functions. This time it's eta three and eta one. The previous one, was eta four and eta one. 
Then there's another x defined by some rational function, and z is defined by some balancing act using the eta functions and the appropriate power of x. Then, almost verbatim as before, the x has a differentiation formula. The b, okay, it's, I think last time we had 64, this time it's 108. The same nonlinear differential equation holds just for different b and different h. So h this time is 12x, and the b in the differential operator, it's this new b. But apart from that, the setup is identical, and the proof is basically th the same, except you use cubic theta function identities, and you just work through the same steps. Um, oh, and, and here's the result. I've, I've put it at the end. So z is... Um, here's the three of two hypergeometric function, if you like that notation, or in terms of binomial coefficients, it's the central binomial coefficient squared times this three n choose n. So this is uh, one of what's called Ramanujan's alternative theories. So now we can go back to the Arpery numbers and look, they have a similar setup. So the um, this time I'm starting directly with the x. It's this quotient of eta functions, z by some balancing process, same nonlinear differential equation, um, same setup with a differential operator. This time a, a difference is the b is... This time it's the square root of a quadratic. The previous examples was square root of a linear. And the h, this time it's a quadratic. For Ramanujan's two examples, h was just um, a multiple of x. And, oops, when you expand, um, substitute a power series into the differential equation, then you get a three-term recurrence relation, and that's where the Arpery numbers come from. So there's this degree of similarity there. And you can do the same for, you know, any, in principle, for any subgroup of SL2R of genus zero. And there's a table of these um, in, 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 in a book. Um, going for levels one up to 12. So there's, there's loads of examples, all with this setup. Differentiation formula for X, second order nonlinear differential equation for Z. And um, so just again, so here is the setup, just so you can see all the examples in one go. Um, differentiation formula for X, nonlinear second order differential equation for z where uh, the b here's the b's um, Ramanujan's first example Ramanujan's second example and the Arpery numbers and the h all right so that's where potentially we can get more examples of these Arpery numbers from so professor cooper just a question Yes, please. So the level here corresponds to the level of the associated modular form, or is it? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Now, um, look. Here's a um uh, exercise, if you like, and this surprised me when I did it. Um, so you know, we've got this second order nonlinear differential equation b is well it's the square root of let's of some polynomial let let's let it be degree k so we've seen linear and quadratic polynomials in the examples so far and let's let h be a polynomial of degree k with no constant term so the examples we've had so far have been h has been linear or quadratic then 
Oh, so it's very easy to convert the nonlinear equation into a linear differential equation. So that's easy. You get a third order linear differential equation. And then we seek a power series solution. So we want to just substitute that in. And it looked, to be honest, I was dreading a little bit what this was going to be like. But it turns out that the recurrence relation can be explicitly written down in terms of the coefficients bj of the polynomial and the hj of the other polynomial. And if these polynomials have degree, if the maximum degree is k, then you get a k plus one term recurrence relation. So I was a little bit surprised that the recurrence relation, um, you can just, just write it down immediately from the data of the differential equation. Um, so that, that, that was a, a, a nice, easy result and a nice exercise if you want to try that. Um, all right, so now that we've set a general picture, let's see where we can get some further RPRI type numbers. And I want to make some conjectures. So you can just work your way through the levels of the modular forms the, the, uh, for the dif different subgroups of genus zero. And here's what you get for level 11. So the function z, this weight two modular form, is given by this theta function. And the x you can define like this. Then here's the differential equation. The d, the differential operator, depends on b. It's this time it's the square root of a cubic. And h is this other cubic. So because we've got cubics here, the general theorem I showed on the previous page allows us to write down a four-term recurrence relation for the coefficients. So we're expanding this z in powers of x, and here's the four-term recurrence relation. And I just want to point out that this recurrence relation, I think the single initial condition, t of 0 equals 1, is enough to start this sequence. Because if you let n equals 0, then you can calculate t of 1 in terms of t of 0. And you don't need a value for t minus 1 because of the n factor here when n is 0. And there's an n factor here as well. And when n is 1, then the n minus 1 factor means you don't need t minus 1. So the single initial condition is enough to start the sequence. Now, because of the um, because the z and x, uh, because of their q expansions, you can deduce, it, it's virtually trivial to deduce that the tn's are integers. So that's not clear from the recurrence, but I'm just going to assert that it is clear from the q expansions that the tn's are integers. So that's a known result. I did that with, um, there were two students at the time. And here's the first few terms in the sequence. And you can ask, you know, do they have any divisibility or number theoretic properties? So here's the first conjecture. So the conjecture is that this sequence satisfies a Lucas congruence for every prime p. So the Lucas congruence, again, what does that mean? It means, so for a prime p, it means for any positive integer, write in, in its base p representation, and then compare t in with t at each of these digits, take the product of those, and the two will be congruent mod p. So I've tested this extensively for uh, you know, primes up to, I think primes up to 10,000 and for um, uh, uh, plenty of n. And I've got no doubt that it's true. How would you prove something like this? So how the other results were proved, they all rely on expressions for T of n as a sum of binomial coefficients. For this sequence, such a formula 
for Tn as a sum of binomial coefficients is not yet known. All right, so that's our first conjecture. For level 13, I'll just go through this briefly. Um, here's the setup, similar to Ramanujan for level four. Start with W, some eta quotient. Define X as some rational function of W. Define Z by some balancing business. And then we get our usual setup with a differential equation. And here's the B, here's the X the H, what are these? They're polynomials of degree three, so we can write down a four-term recurrence relation. The, um, the terms turn out not to be integers, but what I've done is I've taken the non-integer part out and put that in with the X. Then when you do that, then the UNs do turn out to be integers. Now for these ones, um, that's the three-term recurrence relation. For this recurrence relation, it is necessary to specify u minus one and u minus two, because if you simply take n equals zero to, and try and calculate u one, well, that's fine. You can use u naught, but there's um, the n equals zero term will work, but this last term, there's no factor of n to cancel the last term here when n is zero. So we need to specify that u minus two is zero. Similarly, when you come to calculate u two, when you put n equals one in this, you need to specify that u minus one is zero. So I call such a sequence not self-starting because we need to specify these two zero terms. Here's the first few terms in the sequence, and you can analyze it, look for patterns and divisibilities. And I could not find any Lucas congruence or anything satisfied by these numbers. So it's open for investigation. Um, I'm sorry, I've got nothing to report about these numbers. Um, the next level, level 14, so I, I don't need to put the differential equations. I'll just put the sequences. And there's two such sequences arising from the level 14 theory. And these are about both what I call self-starting. You just need the single initial condition to get them started. And so I conjecture that both of these sequences satisfy Lucas congruences for every prime. And level 15, same thing, um, two, two sequences, uh, Lucas congruence is conjectured for each prime. Now, for level 15, there are two other sequences that arise somehow as being inevitable. So the best way to describe them is by these four-term recurrence relations with parameters A, B, C, D, and E. And one of these sequences, the A, B, C, D, and E, they are Gaussian integers. So I here, I squared is minus one. So for these A, B, C, D, and E, uh, yeah, here's, here's the first few. So somewhat remarkably, because again, to calculate the n plus one term, you've got to divide the sum of these terms by the cube of n plus one. So by rights, t of n should be some complex number with rational real and imaginary parts with denominators like the cube of n factorial. So it truly is miraculous that you get Gaussian integers um, in this sequence. Um, so, so, so what? Do they satisfy any properties? So the, proper, the conjecture is that this sequence satisfies a Lucas congruence only, if and only if the prime is two or the prime is congruent to one mod four. Um, Okay, so that's the conjecture for level 15. If we go back to level 
14, there's a similar congruence, um, but here we use a, a, a different extension of the um, of the integers. Um, you can you can read here's here's the conjecture here. So a, so it's a theorem that they're all um, um, all uh, um, of this form x plus y root two, where x and y are integers. And the conjecture is you get a Lucas congruent for the primes, which are one or seven mod eight. Um, look, just going on a bit further, I mean, how, how, how far can you go with this? Here's another example, level 21, that I did with um, a group of mathematicians in Mysore. Here's the setup, similar setup. W is these, uh, this level 21 quotient of dedicant eta functions x is this rational function and z is this um, balancing act here's the setup usual differential equation b and x involve cubic polynomials so we're going to get a um we're going to get a four-term recurrence relation but it's not self-starting, and I could not find any Lucas congruences or anything for this sequence. So, look, my guess is, my guess is, if you're doing four-term recurrence relations, if it's self-starting, now you can tell it's self-starting by looking at the cubics and looking at the um, highest power, what happens is they need to be, the coefficients need to be negatives of each other. If that happens, then the recurrence relation is self-starting. And my guess is if all this arises from modular forms, then you get a Lucas congruence. So the only one I haven't told you about is, is 24. So I just get these four cases. Um, Oh, so, so these four cases, they give rise to another 10, what I would call Arpery type sequences. Um, so 10 sequences arise from this. One from level 11, four from level 14, four from level 15, and one from level 24. All right, so that's 10 more sequences, and there's conjectures for each of those. Um, look, I just want to go on and talk about some, some, some very new work, which I've only just done in the last, the last two weeks, something about what's called super congruences. So look, if you go back to a Lucas congruence, Lucas congruence is A of N is congruent to A of the um, digits here, where you're using the base P expansion. Now, if you've got the base P expansion of N, and then consider P times N, well, that's like multiplying a decimal by 10. You just, all the digits slide along by one place. And that's what happens to the base P expansion. It involves the same base P digits, just the power goes up by one. And so, because applying the Lucas congruence to this situation, you get that A of P N and A of N are congruent mod P. So that's a trivial consequence of the Lucas property. Now, what was observed for the Arpery numbers is in fact actually a much stronger congruence than this holds. The congruence holds not just mod P, but actually for mod P cubed. And because this is a stronger congruence than you're necessarily expecting, that's called a super congruence. And so for the Arpery numbers, um, this was proved again by Gessel, I think, for primes five or above, this super congruence. So naturally, once you see this, the question is, what about super congruences for all the other sequences? So there's the Arpery numbers, super congruence, proved by Gessel. The next one is the dome numbers, the one that the physicist encountered in 1960. So with Henghua Chan and Francesco Sica, um, we proved that the dome numbers also satisfy the same super congruence. 
And we conjectured that the Elmquist Zudelin numbers, which is another um, another um, member of this family, we conjectured that, but we were not able to prove that this sequence A Z of N also satisfies this mod P cubed congruence. Incidentally, that conjecture is still open. Um, some progress has been made. So Armin Straub, in a preprint that's just come out like this, just this last week, he's proved that for the Elmquist Zudelin numbers, the mod P squared congruence holds. So um, that's some progress, but the the con original conjecture is still open. So what about the so-called 15 sporadic sequences? So look, super congruences are known for, actually for all 15. Um, the dome number one is not been proved in its full strength. Oh, so, sorry, the AZ number has not been proved in the full strength. We only have the partial result for that. Anyway, I would refer you to Armin's, um, it's just recently appeared in the archive paper for latest current details about that. What about these other sequences that we've just been discussing? What happens there? So just very briefly. So look, I just want to, as a base mark, I just want to compare with the level seven, which is one of the 15 sequences. There's a cubic conjecture for the level 11, which is one of these new four-term recurrence relations. So I did find some super congruences, but they appear to only be for mod P squared, whereas for the APRI and the other numbers, mod P cubed. So these ones definitely are only for mod P squared, and they seem to only be very rare. So whereas for the other sequences, you get them for all primes five or above, I only found for this level 11 sequence for two, very strangely for 59, and also very strange for 5581. Look, I looked at the statistics for other primes, and other primes don't even come close. They don't appear to satisfy anything at all, like a super congruence. So this is puzzling, and I don't know anything about why these should be the primes. There's not enough evidence to speculate about whether um, there's a super congruence for any more primes. I, I just don't know. And as I said before, a binomial sum is, is known for, T, for level 7, but not for level 11. Oh, I need to speed up. Um, I'll just tell you about one or two more. For the complex valued sequence for level 15, um, th th there's the first few terms. There's a super congruence mod 2 cubed for the prime 2, with a few exceptions. Basically, n is not a 1 plus a power of 2. Um, there's a mod 3 conjecture. It's I conjecture it's periodic with period 8. And there's a mod 5 squared conjecture, provided this very unusual condition, provided the base 5 expansion of n minus 1 does not consist entirely of zeros and ones, and nothing for primes. I went up to I went up to prime for primes up to 10,000. So that's level 15. And one more for the level 24 sequence, I can conjecture a mod p squared congruence for, for these primes. And again, I've got no explanation as to what these primes are or why there should be such a, a congruence. Okay, I need to finish up. So um, back to the RPRI numbers again. So the way to get generalizations of them, or at least one way, one way is to consider modular forms which have this setup, the second order nonlinear differential equation where the 
B and the H are polynomials or square root of a polynomial like this. And more generally, if B squared and H are polynomials of degree K, then you get a K plus one term recurrence relation. And it appears you get something for the self-starting four-term recurrence relations. So, yeah, so the conjecture is, is I'm, I'm guessing there's something there for the primes, 11. Oh, I mean, so this should be L. Um, this, 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 these are levels, level 11, 14, 15, and 24. Here's the last slide. I'm just putting up the level 11 sequence again, and it's conjecture. Um, look, I've, I've just recently finished writing all of this material up, and I've just um, submitted it to the archive, and all of this information, everything I've talked about in this talk, should appear on the archive tomorrow. Um, that's the end of the talk. Um, thank you very much for coming, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Cooper. It was a very nice talk. Are there any questions? Uh, I wanted to ask Sean, uh, uh, you know, what does it mean by having a theory? This is a very strange way of saying something, right? Like Ramajan said, I have theories of this type. What does that mean? Uh, sorry, Gav, I, I, I didn't hear correctly. What are you asking? Uh, I mean, you know, Ramanujan said, I have theories of this order or this level. Now, what does that, I mean, it's a very strange... Oh, oh, oh theories. Yeah. Theories? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Um, okay, Let's hang on a moment. Um, one sec. Yeah, so let's just go back to Ramanujan. Um, yeah, here we go. There are corresponding theories in which Q is replaced by these things. So um, if we look up Jacobi's Fundamenta Nova, so that was the first book on elliptic functions. Um, Jacobi has, you know, the capital K and the, um, the, the elliptic integral and the modulus here. Maybe if I go back, to the um, yeah, so here's an inkling. So what have we got in this equation three? Sorry, I, I, it's, the, the font is so small I can't read it. But this might be it's either all powers or odd powers. You know, this is some familiar product from Q series. So the parameters in the modulus and the complementary modulus have this Q parameterization. And so does the capital K. And I, I, I may have mentioned, um, where did I mention it? Yeah, um, that they have these wonderful parameterizations in terms of theta functions. And so what Ramanujan means is in these other situations, when you start not from the complete elliptic integral, but when you start with one of these other series instead, so this middle one, you can get similar parameterizations by modular forms. This middle one is particularly interesting because the little k here involves the, the, the cubic theta functions. You know, so these are the A of Q, B of Q, C of Q of the Borwines. And this K2 is... Um, I think that's that's a squared. So so it, it means that there's yeah there's a whole lot going on. You you get a, a glimpse of that from this talk. So I, I'm I'm just picking an aspect of it. So here's for the cubic theory. This is just a, a glimpse of what's go what goes on. And what this talk is about is is Ramanujan's theory. So here's a, like an, another version. So Apri numbers is like yet another version of that a level six instance. Um, so I don't know, it's a little bit, um, I, I hope that's something. Um, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. 
So I had a few questions. Please. Uh, so in your paper in Proceedings of LMS, you have uh, talked about the classical cubic and quartic theories related to levels 4, 3, 2. And then the, the level, the one corresponding to the level 6, I think, is gamma 0 of 1. So all these other ones, uh, level 11, 15, 21, they are also concerned with some congruent subgroups of modular forms? Yeah, th th that, that's correct. So um, for the level, so classical, um, with, let's have I got these all on one page? Just one sec. Okay, here, here we go. So um, Jacobi's classical theory is the level four theory. Um, the, what's now called Ramanujan's cubic theory is level three. Ramanujan's other two theories are level two and level one. Mm. Okay. So the level one, that's the 2F1 of one sixth, five sixths. Hmm. Hmm. Um, some uh, that used to be called signature six, um, hmm. but in terms of modular forms, it's level one. You get the signatures, and then there is this corresponding levels, but they, they're not equal. They differ. no signature is something else. I wouldn't worry about the signature. The um, parameter of significance is the level. Mm -hmm. So Ramanujan, Ramanujan and Jacobi. Uh, so Jacobi is level four, and Ramanujan is level three, level two, and level one. Okay. Um, when you go to level five, that's where the Rogers Ramanujan continued fraction comes in. And actually, the Rogers Ramanujan continued fraction, in some sense, that's an analog of the of the modulus little k. The Rogers Ramanujan continued fraction plays the role of this of this little k. So little k is for level four. Rogers Ramanujan continued fraction plays this role for level five. Mm -hmm. And then for level six, um, that's level six, there's three theories. So Apri numbers is one. Um, dome numbers from the physicist, that's another one. And the Almquist Zudelin numbers, where I mentioned the conjecture is still open. That's also level six. So level six, there's three theories. Actually, let, let me scroll back a little bit. I'll go back to Zagia. Have I got the table? Yeah. So Zagia's examples. So level five, this has all to do with the rogers ramanujan continued fraction. Level six, there's three theories. Mm -hmm. Um, Apri numbers is over here. The next one is dome numbers. And the next one with a tick is Almquist Zudelin. And then there's level eight and level nine. So the reason why Ramanujan's level one, two, three, four don't appear here mm -hmm. is because the three term recurrence relations drop that the C is zero. Okay. And they drop down to two term recurrence relations. And that's where the two F1s. Yeah. Come Either from so, so you can yeah you or two third those um... yeah so so that's that's how it all fits uh -huh. yeah so and I, 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 I yeah yep go ahead so for example in the classical theory we call level four because the theta function Jacobi theta function is a modular form and gamma, gamma zero of four that's right so um Similarly, so so, I mean, the only way I've been able to see this is by, by having so many examples and looking at them all and just asking, what do they have in common? <laughs> you know, so you, you know, just get out of bed and just do these things one day. But um, so, yeah, so, so here's the level four. So why is it, this is Ramanujan's thing again, level four, because, you know, it's got this E to four and that's where the four comes from, as simple as that. The, the, oops, the four is just, sorry, the four is just replace Q with Q to the four. Mm -hmm. And the cubic theory, have I got that on the next page? Here's the cubic theory, just replace Q with Q cubed. It's as simple as that, in, in some sense. Okay. Um, level two, yeah, you can replace this, just put E to two here. 
Um, level one, you have to do something else. You've got to use the um, you've got to use the wait for Eisenstein series um, Q of Q. Okay. To get it, and um, for level six, you know, it gets a bit more. You know, you get a few more options here. Okay. Okay. And that's why there's three theories because there's different ways you can arrange these factors and have all the symmetries work out. Okay, okay. Um, but level five, there's only one way to do it. Level five, I didn't put it in this talk, but you would just have e to five and e to one mm -hmm. um, cooked up to the correct power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thanks. That, that's, uh, if, you, if you're understanding this, you're, you're well on the way to, to visualizing it, you know, the, the, the whole theory. So, <laughs> but, but yeah, in principle, you can do this for any, for any subgroup of SL2R of genus zero, and there are only finitely many such examples. So this list that I'm working through, um, you know, it, it it does come to an end. Okay. Oh. And, but, but, yeah. yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, that was about some other question. So uh, if you were telling about the previous one, please go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, as the levels go up, generally uh -huh. the recurrence relations get longer. And so I'm less hopeful that we'll get nice properties. So in these recurrence relations where you have D, for example, you said in the, sorry, not D, but with the C, the Zaghi even, you said that um, it is, uh, the corresponding differential equation has four regular singular points. So is it Hoyne function that comes into? Yes, that, that, that's right. Okay. Yes. Okay. And my last question was, um, is uh, so for the higher odd zeta values, do you think uh, a, a method similar to Aperi could be useful? Or, I mean, how does it go like when you go from zeta three to say zeta five or zeta seven? Yeah, so the expert on that is um Vadim Zudelin. And one of the things he is famous for is he had a theorem, I, I hope I can quote it correctly. Um, his first theorem, I think, was um, he couldn't prove anything about zeta of five, but I think he proved that at least one of zeta five, zeta seven, zeta nine, zeta eleven. I think he proved at least one of those numbers is irrational, and I, I know he's refined that over the years. So, for information about that, I would look at some of Zudelin's papers and. Yeah, he 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 is by far the the expert on on those questions. Okay, thank you, Professor. Sure. Okay, I also have a question. Uh, first of all, thank you very for a very nice talk. Uh, hi, Michael. I, I I can't see you, I but I recognize I recognize your voice. I, I, uh, okay, hi, Sean. Yeah. I'm Michael. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was impressed by this number uh, five thousand five hundred eighty one, which you. Uh, recall uh, appearing as a prime in the super congruence, an unexpected one. Uh, you already mentioned that you're testing for prime numbers up to 10,000. Yeah. Correct. I was wondering for which n are you going? Because if you put in t of 5,000, you get a very large number. And, and, and if you want to multiply that by p, I mean, yep. you get, I mean, how many cases do you test usually? Yeah, that, 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 that's a good question. So I, I did what my computer could reasonably do. So, so of course, as the prime goes up, mm -hmm. the evidence gets, they get harder to check. So um, what I did is I just took primes up to 10,000 and I took mm -hmm. P times N um, up to what a hundred thousand that's what my computer could could okay. safely do so that so means a few case a few n would be possible for that p yeah so, 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 so that yeah. raises the question how reliable is the conjecture so for the p equals 59 um yeah. there is you know many thousands of, so i in the archive article that i just submitted i i, I said how many how many ends I did for 59. I also put a little table for the other primes for mm -hmm. how often you get 
this this recurrence and the the 59 it um it's it's overwhelming the, the, the like i said the other primes don't come close it looks just like noise for the other primes so the 59 is is really resounding but once you get up to 5581 i can't remember if it was something like 17 values of n so it, yes i i imagine it, but it, it's, it's not many but 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 the other primes nearby there's like there's like either no recurrences this, or uh, very unusual that you have uh, such a gap you have 259 yeah. and then suddenly such a prime number because usually I, yeah. one is not even trying for that prime i guess unless one were, does really a systematic search as you did i've got um no explanation and i, I was yeah i was quite um quite intrigued by this so so for 59 i'm convinced there's a there's a conjecture because there's so much evidence for the n for the yeah. 5581 just looking at the data i'm pretty mm -hmm. I'm, I'm convinced enough to, yes, I... to 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 tell other people about it um so so for the other primes like for 24 um where's 24 if i can find it sorry yeah here's the primes for 24 and after 643, I found no more primes up to 10,000. Okay. So that's, you know, you, you get, um, yeah, that, that's what I get for 24. Um, there could be more, but yeah. That's, yeah, yeah, I went up to 10,000. Probably my computer is it won't be able to, yeah. uh, you, you need to invest in some bigger computing power. Then, yeah. I have another question on your complex number uh, cases. If you take only real part and or something like that, would that give new conjectures? If you say you take the real part of this uh, sequence, ah, uh, um, or does that does not make sense? Or the no, 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 it definitely makes sense. So what I've done is I've compared compared. So for the Lucas congruence, mm -hmm. you, know, you can um, you can do the calculation, and yeah, it's for the full complex numbers. So the Lucas congruence involves multiplying um, some of these terms together. So it's it seems to depend on the actual the, the full complex number. Um, so you need the full, okay. yeah. Yeah, and I've I've calculated asymptotic expansions for these as well, and they um work very nicely using the full complex number as well. So that that that's my feeling. Okay, well, thank you. Then. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, Sean, I had yeah. a question. So it's probably like. Uh, I put something in the chat. Or like not necessarily getting into irrational. Uh, um, yeah, Professor Ajit Iqbal Singh, I, I think we'll have your question uh, after Krishnan's one, if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, Krishnan, okay. please. Yeah, just continuing uh, this, for example, the aperic congruence, the aperic numbers are a solution of that uh, recurrence relation that you were saying. But there are other solutions also. and. Like for the rationality, it was essential to have both of them uh, coming into the picture, right? So um, the A N and the B N essentially of Aperi. So uh, it's like, um, is there an is, is there is there a number that uh, you know is intrinsic to the sequence? Like if we had started out with any other uh, initial conditions, uh, we would have probably got. Uh, Linear form in theta two and um, uh, number. I'm sorry, I'm I'm not thought it through, but uh, I hope you are able to get what I'm asking. Yeah, I I, I know what you are talking about. So <laughs> yes, so so, so Apari, when he proved zeta of three was irrational, um, yes. he used the Apari numbers and another sequence. Yes. Yes, which satisfies, I think, the same recurrence relation, but different initial yes. conditions. So yes. I have not, I have not looked at those. 
Um, I've okay. only looked no, at like, the, No, the question is just that uh, it, it so turned out that Epiri would have, even if you had started out with any uh, initial condition, which are integers probably, then the solution would have a reasonably slow growing denominator. It's not n factorial cubed or anything, but it's much, it's dn cubed or whatever it is. Uh, so such properties do you think would hold for the, for the several recurrences you have mentioned? I mean, Zagier has probably only focused on the, or, or all of you have focused on the integ integrality of the solutions. Yeah, um, I, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. What I would do if, if um, mm -hmm. I would probably go back to Gessel's 1982 mm -hmm. paper. Okay. And that's where these super congruences and Lucas properties first came from. And I would, okay. I would look there first to see if he did anything else with the other sequence. Okay. That's sure. That's why I would look first. Off the top of my head, I I, I, I don't know. I, I, sure. I haven't looked at those myself. No problem. Thanks. But yeah, that, that, that's a good question to investigate the other sequences and especially the two in conjunction with each other. With each other. Um, that, yes, that if be... they actually seem to come from some intrinsic irrational number or whatever it is, a number underlying this. That would be nice. Yeah. So I think thanks. Point... it was a great talk. <laughs> we had great fun. Thanks. Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Professor Ajit had uh, some questions. Go ahead, please. Yes, you see, I wondered if there are relationships with matrices because Fibonacci numbers are the number of permutation matrices with bandwidth one. So do your numbers have any such properties? That was one question. Second one was binomial coefficients because many orthogonal polynomials also satisfy binomial relations in place of x raised to j, y raised to n minus j, you take pjx and pn minus jy. And then p and x plus y is in terms of binomial coefficients. So do your sequences have any such property? <coughs> Third thing is that in equiangular lines or sick POVMs studied by quantum information theory people, Fibonacci numbers, Lucas numbers are used. <coughs> <coughs> so do your numbers have any similar role? So, Professor Cooper, by the way, <laughs> big questions are in chat. Uh, are they in chat? Okay. Um, well, I, I might answer a bit differently. I, I, um, what I would suggest is... Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not going to be able to answer those questions, but um, but two very interesting papers I would recommend. Uh, this paper by Malik and Straub. Um, so you asked if these upper numbers arise in matrices. So um, I don't know about that, but they do. One of the things they're very, very important for, which I didn't mention in this talk, is they arise as what are called diagonal coefficients in multivariable Taylor series expansions. And so if you want to see what that is, you can look up this other paper. I hope you can see the bottom of the screen here, but you just need to note his name, Gorodetsky in 2021. Um, he's got a nice survey and lots of more interesting properties um, about APRI numbers that I haven't mentioned in this talk. So again, I, 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 can't, I can't talk about matrices. I don't know the answer, um, but I can say multivariable Taylor series expansions. And so, so that's where you can get into combinatorics. Um, yeah, for the equiangular lines, I'm sorry, I, I don't know about that, so I'm, I'm not able to I'm not able to answer. But I, if, if you're interested, I I hope you look at the paper by Gorodetsky or some of Armin Straub's works, and you might find something in there. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
that's that's where I would look. Thank you very much. Multivariable polynomials are related to tensor products of vector spaces, and they are also used in the entanglement properties of resonating valence bond states. So please send me this paper, which talks about multivariable things. Okay, Thank I mean, the, the best thing to do would be to Google Gorodetsky, if you can see the name there, and, 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 just, and just look it up. His, his stuff is on the archive. You can find oh. it there. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay, good. Okay, if there are no further questions, let's thank Professor Cooper for a wonderful talk. Please, I'll uh, ask everybody.